moderator, uh, Professor Sergio Carrera. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, good morning and welcome, everyone. Um, my name is India Sergio Carrera. I'm Senior Research Fellow at CEPS, and I'm very happy to welcome you all to this final conference of the task force uh, on cross-border data in criminal proceedings and digital justice. This task force has been a common venture, cooperation between CEPS and the Global Policy Institute at Queen Mary University London. And today's goal is really to present the final findings, the, the final report of this task force that has been just released. And we are very, very happy that you can all have access to it uh, today. We've been working quite intensively uh, since January uh, this year uh, in, this, in the scope of the task force. We've had an, a total of four meetings. And I would really like to start by thanking uh, Professor Balsamis Mitzelegas for his cooperation and that of Queen Mary London. Um, uh, it's been a great, uh, again, a great opportunity to work together. And of course, warm thanks to all the task force members, uh, corporate members, institutional members, and to all the colleagues, you know, all the academics, experts, and practitioners who have participated in this collective uh, exercise and learning process. Now, you know, at SEPS, we've been working on this for already several years. Um, quite intensively on this subject. Uh, I could highlight the publication of our report in 2015. And this is, of course, a long tail. You know, this subject has a long tail. And if anything we've learned in our research is that more often than not, the debates on this subject are framed in a law enforcement and policing, policing approach data-driven policing approach, often at the expense of a rule of law approach, focusing on how criminal justice cooperation can take place among judicial authorities. And we've also witnessed the emergence, the presentation of new proposals at EU level, new instruments on e-evidence, uh, which in the name of speed and rapidity are calling for direct access to data held by private companies. And here also we've learned that justice needs time and that speed is no friends of the rule of law. Now, one of the key questions that have often come up in our debates and conversations in the different meetings in the task force has been what are the conditions for deserved or merited trust in the EU criminal justice area, both in its internal dimension, but also in the scope of international cooperation with colleagues and partners in other countries like the US. One of those conditions we found is consistency. Consistency and coherency between what is done internally in the EU and what the EU and its member, sta member states do in cooperation with non-EU countries. We've also seen a condition having the individual at the heart the individual's rights at the heart. We have a new charter of fundamental rights and treaties, which really highlight the importance of effective judicial protection. Effective judicial protection to uphold and to safeguard rights as important for all of us as privacy, but also freedom of expression. And in the scope of criminal proceedings, suspects rights and fair trial rights or issues like professional secrecy or whistleblower protection. You know, all this can be seen and we've learned increasingly how they must be seen actually as essential foundations for pluralistic and democratic societies so that new policies or legal instruments do not generate in our minds the feeling that our private lives are subject to, con to constant surveillance. And here I'm quoting the Court of Justice of Luxembourg. These are not my words. It's a direct quote from the Court of Justice in Luxembourg, which has constantly reiterated the importance of these benchmarks when it comes to policymaking and lawmaking in the area of criminal justice and police in the EU. So of course those rights can be subject to exceptions, but those exceptions must be 
is strictly proportionate and in accordance to the law, meaning that individuals need to know that their own data will be effectively protected. A second condition we've learned as well is the role of private companies, which most of the times find themselves in between expectations, many expectations and roles and new roles, which are part of a state's responsibilities. And if anything those companies are telling consistently as well is please ensure legal certainty. Please ensure that any new proposals in this field ensure legal certainty and that do not expose those companies to potential liabilities or insecurities or costs which they should not bear. So if anything, all our research, and this is the completion, I think five years of research, this task force is kind of the last step. Um, if anything, a big reminder of have we learned any lessons, be it because of the data retention directive, be it because of the passenger name record operation with countries like Canada, be it with transfer of data in the recent judgment Gravis International judgment released also recently. Are these instruments going to be court proof? So today's is an, another occasion to share our research. This is what we do best at SEPS, independent research. And as media mentioned, I will be chairing this meeting. I'm very excited. Uh, we will start with a presentation of the report by Marco Stefan, who is researcher at SEPS. And this will be followed by four discussions, excellent discussions. And I'm very glad and grateful that they've joined us today. We will start with Birgit Sipo, she's a member of the European Parliament and someone who, with whom we've cooperated for a really long time and that we really appreciate her work and her efforts and her expertise on these issues. We will then move to Katerina Nofer, representing the German presidency. So thank you, Katerina, for joining us uh, as well. Uh, she works at the Permanent Representation Germany here in Brussels. Then we will have Lord Baudrillet Nigerard Fair Trials. Thank you, Lord. We've also cooperated quite a lot with Fair Trials, and Fair Trials does an excellent job uh, in really bringing not only the voices of people into this conversation, but also of lawyers and legal practitioners, uh, views and, and experiences on, on these debates. And last, Mark Rottenberg. So we are also very happy because of course this conversation is very much tainted by transatlantic, so-called transatlantic discussions and demands or expectations as well. And Mark is director of the Center for AI and Digital Policy at the Michael Dukakis Institute. So thank you, Mark, also for joining us. So let's start with Marco. Marco, we look forward to hearing the key findings of the report. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, indeed, it's a real pleasure to be here today to present the final uh, result of the task force. Um, the task force report has been published today. And um, for those of you who did not yet the chance to uh, look at it, it is divided in four parts. Uh, next slide, please. The first part, look at the primary and secondary law framework on intra-EU and international cooperation for cross-border data gathering in criminal proceedings. Part two, looks at international initiatives such as the US Cloud Act and developments ongoing under the Budapest Convention on Cybercrime. It also looks at the implication that this initiative has on the coherent and consistent application of the EU criminal justice and data protection law. Part three focuses on the e evidence proposals. It looks at the origins of these initiatives, the rationale underlying them, but also assesses the state of play in the inter interinstitutional negotiation of the different components of the so called e evidence package. It highlights concern that members of the task force have highlighted with regard to the necessity and added value of the new proposals. It also raised a number of legal certainty issues that emerged throughout the task force discussion with regarding to the e-evidence package. 
Part four, set forth a number of conclusions and recommendations for EU policymakers. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the standing EU legal framework, the EU has developed a number of different instruments that currently allow judicial cooperation to cooperate among themselves within the EU, as well as in relation with third countries, in order to gather electronic information which is stored across border by private company or held by service provider subject to another jurisdiction. In particular, the EU has a number of judicial cooperation instrument, and most notably with the European Investigation Order for Inter-EU Cooperation and Mutual Legal Assistance Agreement when it comes to cooperation with third countries, which have a key feature, which is that they subject cross-border data requests to a double layer of judicial scrutiny. Now, this double layer of judicial scrutiny has specific function. It allows at the issuing level, the cross-border data gathering measure Adopted are adopted in line with the material and procedural condition set forth in the system, the legal system of issuing. Also, the scrutiny at the issuing state level ensure compliance is directed at ensuring compliance, compliance with the legality, necessity, and proportionality requirements enshrined in EU criminal justice and data protection law. But in addition to the judicial scrutiny at the issuing phase, there is also an ex ante systematic involvement of judicial authority in the executing state. Now, this systematic ex ante involvement is essential to ensure A, that the cross border data gathering measures are executed in line with the legal process applicable to that specific measure in the jurisdiction of enforcement. Secondly, it is necessary to prevent that the execution of another country criminal justice measure result in unjustified infringement of EU fundamental rights and rule of law standards. Now, if this double layer of judicial scrutiny is to be ensured when it comes to intra-EU cooperation, by extension, it needs to be ensured when it comes to cooperation with third countries, which are governed by different legal justice, uh, criminal justice tradition and legal standard in the field of data protection. In fact, to cooperation with third country, the principle of so-called mutual but not blind trust does not apply. Now let's let's look a bit more in detail in how this instrument of judicial cooperation can and allow judicial authorities to cooperate for the purpose of collecting cross-border information. Next slide please. When it comes to the interview cooperation we already said there is the European investigation order. Now throughout the research we conducted in the context of the task force, we found no evidence that the EIO is by design too slow for the purpose of intra-EU cooperation in the field of cross-border data gathering. The, EIO can, the EIO can be used for the collection, preservation and uh, production of all categories of data, including content, traffic, and subscri basic subscriber information. Now, a key feature that the European investigation order has is that it combines a number of efficient, efficiency uh, features and uh, a number of essential legal safeguards. When it comes to the efficiency, it allows for direct and also real-time judicial coordination. It also allows different investigative measures to be requested across border in one package. It set forth clear deadlines, and it also works in case of urgency, in particular through the support that agencies such as Eurojust provide to national judicial authorities. It also works for non-serious crime, and it can be, in fact, executed to the extent that the execution of the requested measure does not result into an infringement of the essential legal rules that govern evidence gathering in a jurisdiction of enforcement. Of course, there are a number of issues that still affect the functioning of the European investigation order, but these, these issues are not really, really related to the way in which judicial cooperation is designed to function under this mutual recognition instrument, but are rather linked to technical and bureaucratic issues, such as, for instance, the fact that still there are issues and problems with poor translation and time-consuming process of exchanging the data obtained through the EIO, which needs to be sent, first copied into CD-ROM or, or US Big Stick, and then materially sent to post or courier to the requesting authority in the issuing state. Let's uh, go now to the 
uh, next slide, which is going to cover the um, functioning and feature of mutual legal assistance agreements and how they uh, help judicial authority to cooperate in a rule of law compliant way for the purpose of collecting information across border. Um, now, when it comes to on out outgoing requests, meaning requests that originate from the EU and are directed to the EU, the mutual legal assistance process ensure that external cooperation with third country and most notably with the United States take place at an equal, if not higher level of judicial protection that is guaranteed within the EU. Incoming requests are scrutinized by competent US authorities and this prevent that important function are indeed outsourced to private companies or to the issuing state. Finally, this uh, instrument allow the data obtained as a result of this process to be admitted as evidence before a court. Now, when it comes to the other side, so the request coming from the US and directed to the EU, subjecting incoming requests to judicial scrutiny by EU competent authorities is especially important. This has reminded, as also Sergeant mentioned, repeatedly by the Court of Justice of the European Union, both in the field of criminal justice and in the area of uh, data protection. The involvement of judicial authority in the EU ensure individuals and company with access to effective remedies before EU judicial authorities. This is especially important because it has been found even most recently that data subjects do not have access to effective and enforceable remedies in the United States. The involvement of judicial authorities in uh, the EU and before the execution of a cross-border request coming from the, the, the US also provide legal certainty to, to, to companies which are not subject to risk of conflict with the general data protection regulation and the EU criminal justice agreement. Let's go to the next slide, please. The next slide. Thank you. Now this takes us to the issue of private public cooperation. Within the EU, there is currently no legal basis allowing cross-border data requests to be received directly by and executed directly by private company. This request must in fact be received, validated and channeled to service provider by competent national authority in the member state of execution. We found throughout the research that currently requests received by EU, EU service providers and coming from a, a foreign authorities are not executed. Uh, someone said they're directly sent to the bin or when these requests are executed, the service provider needs to redirect the requesting authority, the competing authorities in the executing state. Digital platforms exist at the EU level, but are only established at the national level and allow cooperation between domestic authority, authorities and uh, service provider in their own jurisdiction. When established, uh, these platforms can help significantly help to speed up uh, the process of requesting and obtaining uh, digital information from private companies in a trusted, reliable and automated way. Across the Atlantic, there is some scope for private uh, cross-border uh, private public cooperation but this is only allowed under US law, and it's also limited. In any case, this type of cooperation does not qualify as a judicial cooperation under EU law. Next slide, please. Now, when it comes to the e-evidence proposals, the task force discussion highlighted a number of crucial issues. First of all, their incompatibility with basic EU criminal justice cooperation principles and rules. In fact, when it comes to the judicial scrutiny at the issuing level, this proposal that, not, that do not systematically guarantee an adequate level of effective, meaning independent, judicial protection in the country of issue. When it comes to the judicial scrutiny execution level, none of the proposals so far uh, tabled and being discussed currently guarantee systematic and or meaningful involvement of the member state of execution, nor of the affected member state. And of course, I'm sure we'll later be talking about this notification system. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. Now, for all the different uh, stakeholders that uh, um, participated in the task force debate, the proposal raised a number of legal certainty issues. 
When it comes to the US service providers providing their service in the EU, it appears that the EU evidence proposal will not resolve possible conflict of law at the transatlantic level. These conflicts are only likely to multiply if we empower member states to, to directly order the production of content data to providers subject to US jurisdiction. So the added value for US service provider is not automatically guaranteed by the introduction of this instrument. When it comes to the EU uh, uh, companies, in particular telecommunication companies in the, in the European Union, they have been quite vocal in stressing that they already count on well-established and functioning cooperation channels with national authority of their country of establishment. This type of cooperation currently works well. So the added value is not proven there yet. When it comes to this, uh, let's say, the small and medium enterprises, which are still, which still qualify as a service provider, they simply would lack the operational and technical capacity to promptly react <clears throat> to potentially high volumes of direct order for, for production and preservation orders. When it comes to suspect and accused person, the, let's say, bypassing uh, the existing channel of judicial cooperation will create tension with the coherent application of the procedural rights are key and will present individuals from accessing effective remedy in the country of execution. Also, when it comes to the judicial authorities, it seems that these initiatives will not bring added value because in particular court and judges will be subject to a significant time pressure, which because they will be asked to in, to review potentially large uh, number of orders. And this will eventually reduce the quality of judicial scrutiny across the EU. Next slide, please. Here we come to the recommendation. First of all, we recommend EU policymakers to invest in the European investigation system and strengthen judicial cooperation under this mutual recognition instrument. Secondly, we call for a creation of a new evaluation mechanism which is needed to really assess when a new instrument of mutual recognition in criminal matter is effectively needed. Third, we call for the promotion of judicial digitalization of criminal justice, in particular to speed up cooperation under the European investigation order and mutual legal assistance agreement. Fourth, we call for the withdrawal of the EU proposals on the evidence. And five, we call for the, pre to, for the preservation of the coherence and integrity of a e, the European Union acquis through external action, in particular in the, in the relation with the United States and in the context of the negotiation of the second additional protocol, the Budapest Convention of Cybercrime. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, for your excellent presentation and also take this opportunity to thank you personally for all the work you've done in this uh, task force uh, process and in the report. Um, I think you've really highlighted um, and really summarized in a very nice way the key features and findings and recommendations of the, of the report. Now it's time for our discussions um, to contribute to this debate, uh, starting with Birgit Sipo. Birgit, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And first of all, of course, thanks to Sergio, but also to Mark for their uh, introductions. And also thanks to everybody who contributed to this report. Nevertheless, I have to admit, I didn't have the time to read everything in detail out of the report, but going to especially the parts on e evidence where I will talk about, this brought me back a little bit to the history on what we are talking about. And I might start by saying some words just to remind everybody after all the time where we are coming from. And uh, you might remember very well that the commission started their proposal in uh, April uh, 2018 to enable members to issue pr production and preservation orders and address them directly, as already mentioned, to service providers in another country, uh, thus such already representing an absolute novelty in the area of judicial cooperation within European Union. And only around about six months later, in November 2018, the Council already adopted its general approach. Wow, six months, this was fast. 
And uh, actually this rapidly was not a result of a broad agreement between the member states because at least eight member states expressed their concerns their disapproval regarding the content in a letter to the then responsible Commissioner for Justice Vera Jourova. But unfortunately eight was not enough so they missed one member state to block the general approach. Coming from that, uh, we in Parliament adopted another approach and we decided first to screen the proposal for potential flaws and loopholes by drafting seven working documents together with all the political groups. And based on that, I then presented my proposal in Liebe Committee in October 2019 with in total, I think, more than 800 amendments. So we then started the work based on this to find a compromise between the really very diverging amendments coming from the different groups. Nevertheless, the idea then was to have a vote in Liebe end of March this year. But as many other things with COVID-19, we had to put our negotiations on hold. Then we had the summer break. But now since September, we have resumed negotiations and we are just about to start our shadow meetings. So where are we now? I hope you understand that uh, out of respect for my shadow colleagues and the confidential character of negotiations, I will not go into all the details of our debates. Um, nevertheless, I can reassure you that I'm fighting to find a compromise to address the flaws we have found in our working documents, you found in your report, and which aims at striking the right balance between efficiency or, as member states, fastness of procedures, and on the other hand, proper fundamental rights protection, and to some extent also to protect the judicial system in every single member state and trust into that system. Now, the main focus in the negotiations between the shadows revolves around the question, which already has been mentioned, notification and involvement of the state where the service provider is. And here you clearly can see that particularly the center-right parties want to keep the level of involvement of the executing state as low as possible, and their amendments very often mirror the council's general approach, while on the other hand, the more center-left groups call for much stronger and meaningful involvement of the executing state. So I work to find a compromise which ensures that first the executing state is always informed about issuing of an order at the same time it's been sent to the service provider. And secondly, for production orders, the executing country needs to have the right to object the order. And whenever linked to traffic and content data, uh, this right of non-recognition should also have a suspensive effect. So no transmission of data in that case should take place. Um, regarding the grounds for non-recognition, those shall be mainly uh, based on the very principles that we also find in the already mentioned investigation order and the European arrest warrant. So including especially the principle of Nibis in Edom, Article 6 of the treaty, the charter, but also, of course, the question of immunities and privileges. And regarding more sensitive categories of data, like traffic and content, um, executing countries should also have more reasons for non-recognition. And here I think the principle of double criminality is a very important issue. Uh, such a mechanism of notification and potential non-recognition shall at the same time ensure that the responsibility to decide whether or not an order is lawful is not foisted off on private companies. I think that's an important step. I'm also aiming at significantly strengthen the rights of the person whose data is served. 
So we introduced ex ante safeguards, especially the question and the obligation to the issuing country of necessity and proportionality to be checked before issuing the order. And I think that's important, but also ex post to strengthen the right of information for the person whose data is suffered. Because if you don't know about it, how can you make sure your rights are protected? So in addition, I'm fighting for the introduction of new articles to limit the use of data uh, obtained, to impose erasure obligations, and introduce the principle as to the admissibility of the data obtained. Um, I also hope we can find a compromise uh, first, for the introduction of the right to effective remedies, both for production and preservation orders, and to have these remedies in both issuing and or executing member state. Of course, it's without any question <laughs> that another objective is to bring the regulation proposal in line with the data protection uh, key. Um, very important from our point of view is that we can't accept the introduction of completely vague new data categories, and especially regarding legal certainty and consistency, we should uh, maintain the established distinction of subscriber traffic and content data, including some special treatment of IP addresses depending for which purpose they are requested. So that's a special issue. And also in line with GDPR, we also have to avoid a kind of forum shopping for authorities. Um, and therefore we have to make sure that production and preservation orders are sent to and followed by only one establishment of a provider where decisions on the purposes and means of the processing of data are taken and implemented. And coming back to the important question of pressure on service providers, as already mentioned by introducing notification and right of non-recognition of the uh, executing country, we unchain the service providers from the obligation to check orders of their legality. Furthermore, we are debating about uh, introducing preconditions to ensure that the competent authorities are authenticated ex ante and also to facilitate uh, the exchange of data in a streamlined, efficient and secure way. I think that's very important in this area. Uh, we also have to ensure that service provider have meaningful rights for reimbursement for the cost that come from these uh, measures. And finally, very important, we must not accept disproportionate sanctions re regimes, uh, which might lead to a cooling down effect on the service providers. And here clearly, I think the Council's Commission is highly questionable. Um, coming from all that, I'm very happy that uh, many of the flaws that you highlighted also in your report, in the Commission proposal, but also in the Council's general approach, will hopefully in the end be addressed in the LIBE re report. And uh, even though from your point of view, uh, there might still be points of improvement, I'm sure that your findings seriously will be of major significance when it comes first to the trilogues with Council and Commission, but also during future work on the proposed EU-US regime and the proposed second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention. So to that extent, uh, once again, thanks for the work on this report. I'm happy that we organized this meeting. And because of all the future work, I now am also happy to listen to all the other speakers and hear from them what they think about cross-border data. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Birgit, um, for sharing where we are in, in interinstitutional negotiations of these uh, proposals and uh, for highlighting also uh, the common points between some of the key elements that you've pointed out, uh, highlighted in your own report, 
uh, that reflect indeed our research findings. Um, we've also seen during the different conversations we've had how the work of the parliament, how robust the work of the parliament has been evidence-based uh, methods of really backing up your proposals. And it's really great uh, and very much in line with uh, the better regulation guidelines. Uh, this is really uh, wonderful to see. So we are very happy that we can also contribute with our own research to this uh, process and debate. Now it's time for, of course, we are under the German presidency and uh, we are very much looking forward to hear uh, from Katerina's uh, also uh, update on, on the work of the presidency in this fight. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in the uh, webinar today. Um, indeed, on, on the concrete file on the evidence, I, I can't really give an update from the perspective of the presidency as uh, we haven't had a chance yet to, to, to focus on the evidence package under the German presidency. So here, the, uh, the work which is going on in council right now is, is dedicated mostly to the um, negotiations uh, on the second additional protocol to the Budapest conventions which are moving ahead in, in great speed. And the, the, in, in the council, it's our task to, to make sure that there is, uh, that the negotiation rounds in Strasbourg are prepared properly uh, by the council. And that is actually the meeting I, I, I had to attend today and um, where I managed to, to sneak out to, to participate in the, in the webinar right now. But uh, I was asked to give an outlook uh, or to, to present the perspective of the presidency on the work in the council on, on digitalization of, of criminal justice or of justice in, in general and to, to present the, our initiatives here. And uh, next, the first slide, please. So, so just a quick overview over, over let's say, our, our priorities and key areas on which we are focusing during the German presidency. So there is like the first part is improving access to justice. And that is uh, about which I would like to give you some, some more information in detail during my presentation. Further uh, key areas next to, to strengthening judicial cooperation in criminal matters in, in general. Uh, are also the fight against hate speech and disinformation, as well as uh, fostering the protection of victims of crime in line with the current strategy of the Commission for, for Victims' Rights. And in judicial cooperation in criminal matters, we are on the one hand side focusing on the European arrest warrant, and we also had a conference uh, at the end of September um, looking into the current challenges and, and possible solutions uh, for the application of the European arrest warrant. And another conference, and next slide, please. Um, another online conference as well was held already in July on, on the issue of access to justice in the digital age. And who is interested to, to have a look into this conference there as well, the recording is still available online and you, you can see the, uh, the link which, which is posted here. And our, our idea was to, it, the idea is older than COVID-19. I think the whole question of digitalization of like the national justice systems as well as the uh, European international cooperation uh, has of course uh, been uh, um, accelerated a lot uh, through the challenges during the, the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns at the beginning of the year. But our idea was indeed even older than that. And we wanted to focus specifically and have a look which which um, um, the, into the potential that digitalization uh, of the justice sector could also have. And the key findings of this conference were also indeed that uh, the digitalization of the justice sector is not something that has to happen because of itself, but it has to be human centered. So it's really uh, the, the, the aim is that citizens should benefit from additional digital policy, uh, possibilities and that it's also the expectation of our citizens that, for example, documents uh, can be filed in electronic ways, that there are more modern electronical 
uh, ways to to access justice and to 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 yeah steps to take to gain your right. So the key question was, what can member states do? How can we make optimal use of, of uh, new digital technologies? And here specifically also in view of artificial intelligence applications, which are not so far fetched anymore to also uh, come to use in, in judicial proceedings. We have presented uh, council con draft council conclusions uh, as presidency, and I'm very happy that I can uh, inform you that those council conclusions were adopted yesterday. Um, they were discussed and presented at the Justice Ministers Conference last Friday, but as this was just an, a video conference, an informal meeting, the Justice Ministers were not able to approve the council conclusions, so we had to hand over this task to, to the, uh, the, the ministers uh, on European affairs who adopted those council conclusions yesterday in the General Affairs Council. We also prepared draft council conclusions on the EU Charter on Fundamental Rights in the context of artificial intelligence and digital change. So this is like has a broader concept. It's not focused just on the justice sector. There is going to be another conference in December on uh, like the e-justice the e conference and the focus this year will also be on artificial intelligence. And uh, also in December, there we are going to host together with the European Agency for Fundamental Rights, a conference on AI and fundamental rights. Next slide, please. So those draft council conclusions on access to justice, um, the like the, 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 the aim or the key uh, statement is that further digitalization of the member states' judicial systems has enormous potential to facilitate and to improve access to justice for the citizens throughout Europe and by, by ensuring enhancing the efficiency of the justice systems, also the resi uh, resilience and um, also strengthening the rule of law principle. The draft council conclusions uh, contain different positions and objectives and requests towards the Commission as well as towards the, the member states. So member states are encouraged to make increased use of digital tools throughout judicial proceedings. And uh, we call upon the Commission to develop a comprehensive EU strategy on the digitalization of justice by the end of 2020. The Council conclusions also stress that the use of digital technologies should not undermine the fundamental principles of judicial systems. Here specifically, of course, uh, the independence and impartiality of the courts. So it is also one very um, clear statement in the Council conclusions that the last decision always has to be taken by a human person, by a human judge. And, um, and then last but not least, also the conclusions uh, stress the need to promote digital skills in the justice sectors from justice, uh, justice practitioners, but as well as uh, of citizens who also need to have the, the digital skills to, to use those new possibilities. And the council conclusions also stress that there always has to be parallel possibilities. So next to um, to, to digital uh, possibilities, we also have to ensure that there is the old fashioned traditional way uh, to access to justice so that no one is, is left behind. Next slide, please. Um, as, as we were here talking about cross-border cooperation and cross-border access uh, to the to, to e evidence, I, I, I picked out the, I wanted to point out the, 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 the content of the conclusions which focuses on cross-border cooperation. So here it's more the outlook and, and, and what, what is still to, to be done and, and what uh, council called on commission to do. So here we, we have one paragraph uh, on e-codex and the council reiterated um, it's a call towards commission to present 
um, a sustainable solution for eCodex. I, I don't know how much you're aware of the, the details of eCodex so far. It is like the basis is a project corporation and commission is looking into possibilities to, uh, to, to broaden the scope and to put it on a, on a sound legal basis. Um, as well, same thing is we also called on commission to consider if other judicial cooperation instruments uh, in the field of criminal matters um, could also pro uh, take advantage in the use of the e evidence digital exchange system. So far, the EEDIS is applicable for, for the European investigation order and other mutual legal assistance requests. And so the council has not yet come to a position what we expect specifically on which instruments it should be extended, but the council calls on commission to, to look into those questions and to come forward with suggestions. The EEDIS system as such has been rolled out to member states, but it, we also have to, 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 to know that we're still at the beginning. So the system, I think, uh, first member states uh, will be able to, to use the system uh, from the beginning of, of 2021. And, and I hear as well that it's the call to all member states to, to take action to invest and to ensure that the, uh, um, the evidence digital exchange system is is quickly implemented and can then also develop its full potential. And as I've already mentioned earlier, there's also the call to, uh, to develop a comprehensive EU strategy towards digitalization and uh, also to, to look for means also with regard to, to funding how the EU, how Commission can assist member states in providing seamless access to justice and also in improving the effectiveness and enabling effective cross-border cooperation in judicial matters. And, and here the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has shown very clearly that there is a lack of, of, digital or of digital means for the international European cooperation. So here is indeed, um, there are technical means which can be improved to, to also speed up the, the, the processes between, between member states. Next slide, please. To, to sum up, I also wanted to give you a quick overview about uh, our findings with regards to the, the implementation of uh, artificial intelligence in the justice uh, sector. So it is a fact. I mean, the deployment of AI systems is already being researched and, and developed. There are some member states that stated that they already do apply uh, uh, practical um, systems. The Commission had uh, commissioned a study on the use of innovative technologies in the justice field. And, and yeah, we just pointed out that also in Germany, we have different research projects ongoing um, who also look into the area of criminal law and which uh, um, what potential artificial, the use of artificial intelligence could have could have, for example, to identify child pornography, uh, also to identify hate, cr hate crime and social on social media, uh, machine translation uh, of legal documents, also to how to structure like large files uh, for the prosecution and in the anonymization of court decisions. Next slide, please. Thank you, Katarina. We, Can you conclude, please? Yes, I'm coming to an end. And, and these are like, I don't have to read out everything here. So what I just like those different projects I just described are also more or less like the same uh, areas which were identified where, where AI can really uh, have some added value and, and add in, a, in, a, um, yeah, in, in, in fostering the efficiency of the justice sector. Next slide. On the end, there's always, if there are, if there's potential, there's always the other side uh, where also risks can be entailed. And of course here it is, it is nothing really new, but the council also stated and, and emphasized that the application of AI must not um, uh, amplify existing discrimination, that opaque decision ma making has to be avoided, that black box effect is, um, could, could, could result in the, in the um, um, 
yeah, could, could lead to negative effects of, uh, on, on, on fundamental rights and on the principles of a fair trial. And thus, next slide, we ended up with um, concrete recommendations. I mean, here as well, it is, it is clear that the fundamental principles of judicial systems must be guaranteed and cannot be infringed by, by new technologies. And now I come to my last slide, which is that the council also stressed that it might be necessary to come to, to regulatory to a regulatory framework and set up precise conditions under which new technologies, artificial intelligence might be used, might be applicable in the justice sector. I think that's the very last slide where this is described. So much from the perspective of the presidency, uh, what, what has been going on in the field of, let's say, uh, digitalization of justice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Katarina, for your excellent uh, presentation and uh, also for highlighting not only key developments, but also achievements, uh, already clear achievements of the German presidency in this area, uh, particularly the question of digitalization uh, that also corresponds to the discussions we've had in the task force, the potentials, as well as the risks, but also the potentials that COVID-19 has also opened up uh, to precisely address this question of, uh, you know, making more efficient uh, already existing instruments of judicial cooperation and, and judicial proceedings. So I think it's very important uh, that the presidency is highlighting this uh, and working specifically on this issue, interoperable justice, area of interoperable justice, it's a very interesting one indeed. Uh, so really thanks a lot. Um, when it comes to the impacts of this digitalization and uh, e-evidence proposals on fair trials, of course, uh, Laura is very well positioned uh, to tell us and to also uh, present some of those elements. Laura, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, congratulations as well from me um, to the team at SEPS and Queen Mary University for your excellent report. And thank you, Sergio, for your kind introduction and to the previous speakers for their interventions today. For those listening in who do not know us, Fair Trials is an independent and nonpartisan NGO. We operate as a global criminal justice watchdog with offices in London, Brussels and Washington. And in Europe, we coordinate the Legal Experts Advisory Panel, a criminal justice network consisting of criminal defense law firms, academic institutions and civil society organizations across the EU. And I will focus on one of the aspects of the report, the implications of cross-border data gathering and exchange um, for the persons primarily concerned, the suspects and accused persons who are the subjects of criminal investigations and whose rights are at stake here. Because we cannot lose sight that ultimately the information that's being gathered that may be used as, may end up being used as evidence against a person to base a conviction and possibly even lead to imprisonment and this requires that from the very outset of the investigation, when these tools are used, safeguards are in place to ensure that the proceedings are fair and that any conviction is safe. But before looking at these safeguards um, that we think are necessary in the context of cross-border cooperation, I'd like to take a step back and set the scene um, in which these proposed new tools would be adopted and specifically three key trends. First, of course, the state of the rule of law in Europe. The first rule of law report was published by the commission and depicts unexpectedly a pretty bleak picture of the situation in Poland and in Hungary, but calls out numerous other member states as well on the state of judicial independence. And this is a real and immediate threat to people's rights. Just this week, it was reported that Norway granted asylum to a Polish criminal, a convicted man convicted facing prison for fraud and forging documents, who argued that his sentence was a form of political persecution. The second trend, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which has created, as Catherine um, pointed out um, and described, a real opportunity to speed up the process of digitalizing, uh, digitalizing justice systems. Um, and I'd just like to flag as well this concept of digitalization, which has great opportunity as well um, to support defense rights equally. But it also covers sort of this interoperability of different systems, um, different databases to improve cooperation across agencies and across countries. And we're seeing an accumulation of data being gathered and shared and also consequently 
the need to develop algorithmic tools because AI is necessary to analyze all this data that's being collected. It can't be obviously an investigator on his or her own. And then the third trend, this increasing state intrusion on our private lives and their ability to do so because of digital data gives them gives everyone a pretty complete picture of each one of us, of our movements, our health, our conversations. And we see blurring of the lines between surveillance and criminal investigations. We see increasingly um, evidence derived from surveillance tools being used in criminal investigations, for instance, criminal trials. And this has become even more relevant in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, where many countries introduce legislation that broadens the powers of authorities to collect private information, including our movements and contacts from our mobile phones. And we see the impact of these different trains, trends in the functioning of international cooperation instruments, starting, of course, with the European arrest warrant. Most notably last month, the Amsterdam court suspended all surrenders to Poland due to concerns about judicial independence. So this is the context in which we are now looking at adopting more new cross-border data gathering instruments. And I'll focus on the European production order because of lack of time, but also limited information about the EU-US negotiations. But fundamentally, I echo what um, Sergio said, the same principles will apply. Fundamental rights that are protected under EU law, data protection, privacy, right to fair trial cannot be undermined in cooperation with third countries. Um, and these rights require safeguards um, because if we need, we need to put the persons concerned at the heart of the instrument. It's not just a question of cooperation between authorities. And we're hugely encouraged by the European Parliament's approach and in particular MEP Sippel's decision to take the time to consult widely and put forward some key safeguards, which she's highlighted in her presentation. And the starting point here is of course the ability for a person to obtain remedy at trials but it needs to be recognized that this is only a starting point because the reality is that people may never know that they've been subject to these measures unless criminal proceedings are actually initiated and the information obtained from these instruments is actually included in the file and that that file is actually fully disclosed to the defense so lots of hurdles there um, to get to uh, a remedy at trial and then we also need to specify what remedy Birgit has suggested admissibility and of course the fact that law enforcement cannot use illegally obtained information at trial is key both to limit the risk of innocent people being wrongly convicted but also to create a disincentive for law enforcement to act outside the law but there are no common EU standards on evidence. All we have is jurisprudence from the European Court of Human Rights, which leaves courts a very, very broad discretion, unless we're talking about torture. And then we fall back into national law, and we've got a wide spectrum across EU member states. So the proposal needs to include as well to specify what remedy can be obtained, but also how we need to give meaning to this concept of effectiveness of a remedy, because we can question the effectiveness of such a remedy if, for instance, we have the possibility to ask for inadmissibility, but that the, the investigation was based on information that is then considered inadmissible or tainted the view of the court where that inadmissible evidence is kept on the file and seen by judges, which is the case in many countries. Added to this, many of the people who are caught up in the criminal justice system simply do not have the resources to afford a defense that will look into sources of evidence and how it's been obtained and challenged it and instead rely on legal aid and here we're facing a f the problem that legal aid is severely underfunded across europe so this makes it necessary to take a step back and reinforce the safeguards at the issuing stage before these measures are actually adopted. We cannot leave it all to a possible criminal trial. So what ex ante safeguards should we have? We need a robust legal framework that clearly states the conditions and circumstances that allow the authorities to use their power to obtain cross-border information. We could have a threshold in terms of minimum sentences based on criminal codes or based on type of crime, but we've seen with the EAW how this isn't enough to prevent use for minor offenses. We recently heard about a case of someone being, uh, EAW being used for someone for shoplifting toothbrushes in a supermarket. 
Um, so this is also a reality we need to recognize. And the most effective safeguard in this respect would be to introduce a sufficiently high threshold that law enforcement must be required to meet on top of severity of crime to issue such a request. For instance, reasonable suspicion. We must also require law enforcement make a case on the relevance and the materiality of the information they are seeking. And of course, proportionality of the measure in light of the privacy intrusion that it involves. And then of course, this takes us into who, who can assess whether this threshold has been met. We need here an independent and impartial authority involved. And this is something the CJU has been grappling with over the past year or so, since it's been seized with a series of challenges in relation to whether prosecutors may issue EAWs. And for me, one of the key lessons from these rulings for us today is the right to effective judicial protection in relation to the issuing of such instrument. And that right means a check that the safeguards derived from fundamental rights are guaranteed, a proportionality review in light of the individual circumstances in each case, and a review that's exercised objectively, taking into account all incriminatory and exculpatory evidence and independently from the executive. And I very much doubt that this can be assured by authorities who are charged with the investigation, who are responsible for building a case against a person. It seems to me that a court, um, something as well that the report highlights, which is independent from both the executive and the investigation authority, is the only appropriate judicial authority to conduct a review and therefore issue requests for data. Um, and then we turn to an ability to challenge the issuing of such a measure, including explicit grounds that enable a person to seize a judicial authority to ask that the execution of the measure be refused, where there's a risk of fundamental rights being breached as a result. And this has already been discussed today, and I will just emphasize that in that context, we need to think about a legal avenue, the right for the person concerned to resist the execution of an order. And for a challenge to take place, obviously, we need notice. We need notice to the person, because as long as you don't know about a measure, you won't be able to exercise any possibility to challenge. And if there's a risk that this person will go ahead and delete everything, that's, of course, a possibility, then we can envisage a possibility to ensure that the data is preserved, for instance, pending the outcome of a challenge procedure. But notice to the person is not just about enabling the right to challenge. It's also about equality of arms because criminal proceedings are characterized by this information asymmetry. And notice will help balance it out if it's coupled with the right for the defense to also access relevant data, which may help ex exculpate the person under investigation, a right that's recognized in the context of the European investigation order, for instance. And then finally, beyond judicial oversight in individual cases, I really want to reiterate the importance of independent bodies to oversee more systematically the operational activities of law enforcement authorities and monitor their use of all these tools, because effective oversight mechanism will ensure that we insulate against the risk of improper use, but also in a positive way, help protect the reputation of legitimate law enforcement activity through increased transparency. And to go back to the bigger picture of ex the, this extensive, um, these extensive and very diverse data collection powers across different fields, not just criminal um, investigations, and the blurring of these different tools and the interoperability of systems, we clearly need sa strong safeguards on the use of the data that's collected. This use should be strictly limited to the specific criminal investigation for which they've been the data has been collected and also deleted as soon as the investigation or the trial comes to an end. And then finally, we need to face up to the rule of law crisis. We cannot wait for a political outcome to an Article 7 procedure. We need to address the implications of this crisis on the functioning of cross-border cooperation. For instance, we should consider a mechanism um, such as the European Parliamentary Research Service suggested for the suspension of cross-border cooperation altogether. We cannot leave it to a case-by-case -case decision. We've seen how difficult it was um, in, for, for national courts to apply the Salmer uh, CJU test. Um, and the Amsterdam court um, has shown us the way in the context of the European arrest warrant by suspending um, EAW surrenders altogether, uh, pending an outcome of that 
reference. So to wrap up, um, law enforcement authorities already have many, many options to get hold of electronic information, starting with domestic tools, which they use widely. They also have international MLA agreements, voluntary cooperation, and of course, the European investigation order, which we haven't even properly assessed and allowed time to settle in to practice. And we know that tools we create for law enforcement that often stem from exceptional circumstances and framed as enabling the fight against serious crime, which we all agree about, end up being extended to all sorts of crimes, including minor offenses, and expanded at the expense of fundamental rights. So if we're going to go ahead with this instrument and disregard um, SEP's <laughs> call to um, abandon this proposal, then we, we need, um, and we need to make sure we really need, do need such a tool. And then we need, the, that's what the call today to, law, to um, policymakers is to ensure that we have a sufficiently robust legal framework that includes effective safeguards, as well as a call for funding and investment in our justice system, something the commission called for in the rule of law report, because we cannot ignore the risk that we're facing today of rule, rule of law backsliding and increased um, state intrusion in each and one of our lives. So thank you very much. And I'll hand back to Sergio. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lord, for inviting us to, to take this step back. Um, and uh, to really highlight very central issues. Uh, indeed, the rule of law is not just a question of Poland and Hungary, where we have systemic threats to that rule of law, which are very worrying indeed, but it's also a common issue for all member states. and. Uh, comes across not only questions of independence of judiciary, but many other issues as well, uh, not least democratic participation, uh, free and democratic participation, and other central uh, elements at stake, but also your proposal of a threshold, because indeed, I mean, this is an area where we see very high risks, significant risks of unlawful uh, access and use. Uh, and therefore, this kind of safeguards could address uh, this, um, hopefully, some of those. I'm sure that Marco will come back perhaps in, uh, after on the proposal or our proposal to withdraw these proposals based on the research um, uh, developed on that. But now let's move, uh, let's give the floor to Mark, who has been patiently waiting and that we are very much looking forward to hearing. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much, Sergio, and thank you uh, everyone for the opportunity. Uh, to participate. I did have the chance to uh, read the report and I do want to congratulate Seps and Queen Mary and, and the authors and, and all the uh, task force members for, I think, a very uh, comprehensive approach to a timely, important issue, uh, clearly presented good recommendations. So thank you for your work. I also wanted to uh, uh, thank Mrs. Sippel, who I've uh, been in contact with over the last several years on the e-evidence uh, proposal. We've made uh, some recommendations on that. I, I appreciate her uh, situation trying to uh, negotiate uh, among different members who have uh, differing uh, views of the, of the problem. And of course, also to thank uh, Val Simis, who gave me the opportunity a couple of years ago to come and give a bit of the uh, history. I'm, I'm afraid that I have to uh, take some credit for the problem that you are uh, facing today. And uh, let me just say by way of background that I worked um, in the United States Senate uh, many years ago. Uh, the shorthand is in the last uh, century. Uh, and the aim that I had at the time was to update the federal wiretap law to take account of the emergence of email and, and stored uh, data. And that's how we enacted the Electronic Communications uh, Privacy Act. And it was that statute, which was central, in fact, to the uh, Microsoft uh, case that went to the US Supreme Court a few years ago. I was, in fact, a bit surprised as I began to follow the development of the case that the privacy law that we had helped enact uh, in the US was now being cited as the legal authority to seize evidence in a foreign jurisdiction. Uh, that struck me as a bit upside down but of course, from the position of the Department of Justice, the law had created the basis for the uh, US attorneys to go to a, an internet service provider and obtain evidence uh, related to a criminal investigation. 
So the, the question that we wrestled with a bit in the Microsoft case was how to explain the um, fundamental problems with viewing a privacy law in this fashion. And if I can take uh, just a moment here, I'm going to uh, share with you the um, brief that we filed in the US Supreme Court when the Microsoft case uh, was pending. And um, we were not a party to the case, which is to say we did not represent uh, Microsoft, but we were on Microsoft's uh, side of the case, which at the time had resisted the um, uh, order from the US Department of Justice. Now, I'm not going to go through the brief, but you know, a good amicus brief summarizes the argument at the outset. And so I'll just call your attention to the summary of the argument that we presented when the case was pending uh, before the court. Uh, we raised questions about what we described as a unilateral law enforcement uh, access. And frankly, this is a somewhat conservative argument that we made to the Supreme Court at the time. There is a well-established doctrine in US law, as I think there is in most democratic nations, which presumes that laws have national effects, but they do not have extraterritorial effects. And as a consequence, uh, the court is reluctant to view um, its authority as, as reaching to other nations. So we made this argument to the court, uh, reminding that the application of the Communications Privacy Act in this circumstance would have these extraterritorial, extraterritorial effects, which the court would typically disfavor. We also uh, suggested that it would make more sense to have a process in which the relevant parties uh, participated to develop a common framework for access to evidence in foreign jurisdictions. So these are, as I said, both um, fairly modest and, and conservative arguments. But the second part of our brief did speak directly to concerns that we had at the substantive level that uh, such access may violate international norms concerning data protection. And, um, you know, going here now to the key arguments. We had our various experts uh, participating um, and you'll find this online, but um, we said explicitly the Supreme Court should not authorize searches in foreign jurisdictions that violate international human rights uh, norms. And we cited, of course, uh, you know, the convention and the charter and a number of the relevant uh, EU cases in support of this conclusion. So we were all, in fact, um, very interested to see uh, what the US Supreme Court would do when, when uh, faced with this uh, uh, controversy. The Department of Justice, of course, was quite eager to obtain the information and, and Microsoft, at least at the time, we thought was doing the right thing by uh, resisting. Uh, but as you may know, uh, the case was effectively mooted, which is to say the court never reached uh, a judgment in the dispute uh, somewhat on the sidelines. The Department of Justice and Microsoft negotiated over the draft legislation that became the Cloud Act, which uh, both of the parties, Microsoft and the Department of Justice said effectively resolved the matter because now they had put in place a legal framework that would create, uh, they said some safeguards for this extraterritorial reach of, of US law. Now, while Microsoft and the Department of Justice may have been happy about the outcome, I can tell you frankly that the uh, civil society groups, both in the US and, and Europe were not. Uh, we did not uh, believe that the Cloud Act provided a sufficient basis to uh, grant access in a foreign jurisdiction. And almost immediately, if I can find my uh, second document here, uh, about 20 of these groups uh, wrote to the members of the US Congress. This is a detailed list of the committee uh, chairman and, and the opposing member in the, in the 
you know, ranking uh, member of the opposition party, which is to say this is nonpartisan. It's not an appeal either to the Democrats or Republicans per se. It's simply asking the relevant members of the key committees uh, not to agree to the initial uh, executive agreement, which followed from the Cloud Act. And it's a good statement. Uh, again, I'll post this, it's available online. It went out uh, October of last year. It provides some of the history about the passage of the uh, Cloud Act. And as you'll see at the top of page three, since the passage of the Cloud Act, civil society has stood in near unilateral opposition to the Cloud Act and consistently noted the baseline protection afforded individuals under executive agreements uh, fails to meet human rights standards. So this is a, I, I think also a, uh, a thoughtful, clear statement about the problems uh, with the Cloud Act from the human rights and data protection uh, perspective. I wanted to just make briefly one um, final point uh, because of course, as I said, when we were writing the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, we did not anticipate that this type of problem uh, would emerge, uh, which is to say that it would become the legal basis to gain access to personal data in circumstances where in fact, you know, the, we would say the legal basis is insufficient. Um, but having created this problem and, and you know, fully respecting the process of the, of the European Parliament to try to come up with a, a, a good solution. And, and there is, by the way, you know, just to say a word in support of, of the law enforcement interest here, there is a genuine interest in enabling uh, mechanisms that do provide access. But I think as one of the you know, speakers who just spoke pointed out, this is a mechanism that has to take place in a context that's trusted. And for that to happen, you need rules of notice and transparency and remedy and so forth. So the ultimate objective, it seems to me, is a shared objective. It's, it's not a problem without a solution, but it is a solution that requires a careful examination of the relevant standards to ensure, you know, fairness and accountability in the process. And as I sometimes, you know, remind my friends in the law enforcement community, they have a genuine interest in ensuring that a trusted process operates because they know from experience that sometimes they can interact you know, with, a, with a law enforcement agency in another jurisdiction that may not be reliable. And there's a very practical reason, uh, I would argue, to ensure that these mechanisms ensure reliability. It actually protects the interests of, of a good law enforcement agency. But my uh, final point uh, here, and it's a somewhat subtle point, it's about language. But um, because I participate in many of these similar discussions, I want to kind of pick up on a point that Mrs. Sippel raised that I think is very important not to lose sight of. And that is the notion of double criminality or what we might sometimes call legal reciprocity. You know, to prosecute a crime in one jurisdiction and to seek evidence in another jurisdiction typically means that both jurisdictions believe that a crime has occurred and that the rules of obtaining the evidence for both jurisdictions have been uh, satisfied. That's a very important principle in international law, and I think it also helps sustain democratic governments against you know, what you sometimes rightly describe as, as problems with rule of law inadequacy. But here's my key point. This is very different. This baseline, this foundation for rule of law and democratic governments is not at all the same as interoperable. In fact, interoperable, I would argue, operates almost at cross purposes with the goal of uh, dual criminality. It says in effect that, well, yes, we may have different legal systems, but let's at least create technical mechanisms to move between jurisdictions to enable data flows or to enable what other, you know, purpose people describe. And this is precisely wrong. In other words, interoperable is how we describe the interaction of, of technical systems, but it is not at all how we describe the interaction of legal systems. Legal systems require common standards, high standards, respect for sovereignty. 
And this is not a principle that's derived from interoperable. So I just wanted to put that issue on the table. I think Mrs. Sippel was absolutely right um, to note uh, this in her comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, also for bringing light to the critique and the application of interoperability in this area um, and the conditions for trusted uh, cooperation based on fairness and accountability. Now, time is running. Uh, so I would like first to ask Marco if he has briefly any response back to the panel. Many um, points of um, the speakers actually um, help to further um, put the like, details in the in the um, and highlight some of the important uh, aspect that needs to be taken into account if uh, negotiation of the of the proposal are, um, um, are, are are going to you know to continue. But I would like just to um, maybe go back to three three um, points: two concerning the internal uh, components and one the external ones. So um, and really insisting on on you know the importance of um, of the fact of judicial protection at the issue and executing level. When it comes to the issuing, uh, as uh, already highlighted by by law, um, indeed there are uh, important uh, lessons to be learned from the uh, from the Luxembourg jurisprudence. Uh, we see that uh, in the proposal advanced um, by by Mr. Sipon, in fact, there is uh, the intention to. Get closer to you know the standards that have been uh, highlighted by by the by the court when it comes to um, the qualification of issuing authority under the the European arrest warrant. But in in fact, it seems that the discussion is going a bit uh, beyond that. And I wanted to you know also to flag here that it is indeed important to not just consider the independence from the executive, but also from the the the, the authorities in charge of directing the pre file phase of, phase of the. Of the procedure, this is not currently reflected in the, in the at least in the public version of the of the of the report. Um, then, when it comes to the to the executing uh, authority um, discussion, the task force has highlighted some of the issues related to this smooth notification system. Uh, most notably, the possibility that even if notified, the member state uh, the authorities in the member state of execution do not react when they should have done so. Um, so one. Uh, uh, let's say point that was highlighted as critical here was in fact that legal certainty can be ensured only in present of a formal validation by the executing authority of the incoming uh, order. So only when the order is actually validated by the competing authority in the executing state, then there is legal certainty for also the, the private sector that they can in fact execute such order. But uh, without that validation, uh, there will still be a legal uncertainty because, in fact, it's not sure whether the, the, that measure is effectively legal under the jurisdiction of enforcement. So that is actually a uh, quite important uh, point that emerged uh, in, during, the, during the meeting. And then just uh, um, a bit to Katerina regarding the, in fact, the ongoing negotiation um, of the uh, second additional protocol to the Budapest Convention. Uh, an important point here to ensure consistency is that, in fact, the baseline for negotiation, for negotiating the EU position and for advancing the EU position within this, this negotiation for is not to take the e evidence proposal as a reference point. Because of course we see there's a lot of uh, uncertainty regarding with the actual content of this of this uh, of this legislation. So uh, it, it would be interesting to and important to to know that in fact that this negotiation position is developed based on the existing acquis, not on pieces of legislation that are current, currently under discussion and where in fact there's uh, much debate uh, still ongoing. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Uh, there's been one participant, a couple of participants asking question concerning how to ensure uh, at, which, at which state should the person be notified? There's been a lot of emphasis being put on the need to notify the person in a timely manner. Uh, one participant is asking at which state precisely, and also a question about who should be this independent authority, Lord, that you, would, you, were, you were referring to, who should play that role? In this respect, uh, Lord, you have the floor. Maximum two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for the the question. So, the independent authority in the context of the reviewing the decision to issue uh, the 
um, the measures, if that's the question, or the oversight body. I'm not sure, but if it's the first, the oversight body. The oversight body. Um, so here, what we we see is that there's already some mechanism of oversight uh, in the sense of through data collection and monitoring of the use of instruments uh, that the European Commission exercises when it comes to to EU instruments, but that. Uh, data collection is extremely limited um, and the oversight as well in the sense that we not having uh, regular uh, implementation reports or infringement proceedings coming out of this review. So the first, when you come talking about EU instruments, it's obviously the Commission as a monitoring authority who should have a much bigger a role in terms of getting information from member states, getting information beyond member states, also from other sources other than ministries of justice uh, to, to confirm uh, how these instruments are being used and implemented. I think that for when it comes to cross-border instruments, we could look at uh, reinforcing that role. Um, and so the in terms of the, the second question, remind me, Sergio. Yes, the, the, first, the second question was about when should the individual be notified? When people should be notified? Well, if they should be notified before the data is actually transferred uh, to the issuing country. And that is absolutely key because once the information is transferred, then the ability to challenge, to raise objections, to, uh, to raise concerns about fundamental rights is too late. And so that's why we recognize at the same time that it would need to be coupled with the ability uh, to preserve the data, to ensure that there's no risk of the data being destroyed. Um, upon notification and also in, in exceptional circumstances as well that there could be an obligation, a, a restriction on informing the person. Um, so a form of gagging order on the tech company or the authority who's notified about the uh, request for information. And that, that could also be envisaged by a tightly controlled mechanism in the sense that it would be an order that's judicially reviewed, um, an order that's limited in time, and that is strictly justified on the basis of, of, of justified by concerns in the, in the case at stake. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Laura. So I'm afraid it's time to conclude. I would like to give the floor to Valsamis. Valsamis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sergio. Uh, a big thank you to SEPS, of course, uh, for uh, another successful collaboration. Uh, we're very pleased because this is uh, a launch report for the new Global Policy Institute of Queen Mary, uh, which aims to uh, advance cutting edge thinking on a number of areas, including rights, inclusion in the digital world. And uh, thank you to all of the participants in this task force. It has been really fascinating to discuss a, a highly complex uh, uh, issue. And I just want to conclude very briefly, making four points related to the rule of law in the digital age. And these points are relevant to the specific dossier, but I think uh, judging from what we've heard today, they are also relevant for the future development of, uh, of EU action in the digital field. Um, and a number of speakers have mentioned blurring of boundaries. So I want to highlight four areas of blurred boundaries uh, and uh, recommend vigilance uh, when we uh, talk about upholding the rule of law and the protection of fundamental rights. So the first uh, point that I would like to make is about framing. So, you know, what, what are we really talking about here? And digital evidence has really thrown this into sharp relief. So. Are we talking about judicial cooperation in criminal matters? Are we talking about actual criminal investigations? Are we talking about surveillance? Or are we talking, looking at the Council of Europe Convention about the very broad and malleable concept of cyber crime or cyber security? This is very important, I think. Depending on how we frame an issue, we also frame the answers to this. And we saw how complex it is to really delimit the interplay between um, safeguards in the criminal justice process, judicial independence, evidence admissibility, and privacy and data protection issues. And I think in this report, it has been demonstrated we need to take a holistic approach. And as Mark mentioned, not to use certain areas of law to circumvent others. So, you know, and I think that's really important in order to have clarity of thinking in the future. 
when we talk about the digital. The second area of blurred boundaries is obvious in, the, in, the, in this dossier, and it is the blurred, blurred boundaries of responsibility between the public and the private. What, does, what do we mean by a public-private partnership? What are the responsibilities of the private sector in a, a rule of law based society? Uh, is the private sector really required to make fundamental rights assessments? And you know, does the private sector really have an equality of arms, if you like, with the state? I mean, in the field of mutual recognition, uh, the, the president of the Court of Justice has said that mutual trust is based on equality between the national authorities. So it is judicial authority to judicial authority and they can embark on a dialogue on mutual trust, how can we say that there's a quality of arms between an authority in one member state and a private company? I think this is also too much to ask for the private sector themselves. The third aspect of blood boundaries has to do, uh, and that's relevant in the whole uh, digital debate, if you like, is the, the boundaries between, and that was mentioned also just now, between the technical and the legal. And uh, we are going to uh, be discussing more and more about interoperability. Interoperability should not be here to subvert the rule of law protections. Uh, and uh, already, if you see the documents in, the, in 2005, where the first time the Commission talked about interoperability, the framing was that this is merely a technical issue. There are no human rights implications. If we just connect what we already have, you know, then we will be fine. That's a quite a risky thinking, and I think we need to be alert and vigilant. Finally, and I stop here, I promise, the blurred boundaries between the internal and the external. And I think this becomes even more important in the digital world, where we discuss about whether data is localized or not, and what is the meaning of cross-border in a sense. And I think I just want to remind, as I always do, that the treaties currently, the EU treaties, uh, impose on EU institutions a duty not only to uphold, but also to promote EU values in the world. We need to be very cognizant of the fact that the EU benchmarks, which are not only secondary law, but they are also benchmarks in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, are applicable externally, whether we like it or not. And I'm very concerned by the fact that, A, we have really commission proposals on e-evidence being proposed essentially to match uh, an, an initiative in another country, the Cloud Act. So, you know, and really this being developed as a secondary benchmark for external action. But I'm also concerned by the fact that as we see the German presidency so far, maybe it's an issue of timing and of circumstances. You know, we have progress on the negotiations of the Council of Europe protocol uh, while the internal negotiations are not progressing. And I would like really to flag up the, the need for the European Union in its external negotiations, really to be cognizant of the internal key like, benchmarks as developed also by the Court of Justice. We will have further opportunities to discuss these issues. These are not going away. Thank you all for your contributions and uh, thank you to the colleagues for self for your collaboration and for this great report. Thank you. Thank you, Valsamis, um, indeed for your, your concluding remarks. And if anything, I think it's a wonderful way to put an end uh, to this conversation and debate. And certainly this doesn't stop here. Uh, we will definitely continue as the subjects and the topics continue. And if anything, uh, coming back and finalizing with Balsami's points, uh, we really hope that our work is really facilitating, clarifying these lines so that these blurred lines that Balsami was referring to with our research and this kind of events, we bring light to what the actual issues and questions of common concern to all of us are. So big thanks to all of you, uh, of course, to the panelists, and to the colleagues and to all of you who are still watching. Uh, and uh, yeah, let's speak soon.